This is the Platinum Podcast. Welcome to the Platinum Podcast, Barry. Stoked to be here. I'm excited to have this one, man. It's going to be really good. Um, interesting way how we met each other. I think this would be an interesting little story for everyone who's <laughs> listening right now. Would you care to elaborate on how we met? Yeah, we actually met uh, at a Tantra workshop, uh, eight day, seven night long Tantra retreat in uh, Ubud, Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. I, I love this one. So I've had so many people ask me that it's like, what is a Tantra retreat? What does that even mean, right? And I've been trying to explain it in so many different ways. I'd love to hear, <laughs> I'd love to know how you're going to explain oh. in a kind of, in summary, what a Tantra retreat is and involves. Yeah, well, I think Tantras uh, generally refer to, whenever we think Tantra, they just think sex. Uh, and definitely there's an element of, of intimacy and sex involved, but it's a lot more than that. Like Tantra is how I guess we communicate and interact with not just each other, but ourselves and the world around us. And so for me, Tantra is in many ways an aspect of spirituality, aspect of way of living. And of course, like if we're able to interact better within ourselves and to know ourselves better and to be able to process our own emotions better, and we're able to communicate with other human beings better, naturally that's going to have a profound impact on our sex life, right? And our ability to have like amazing, sure. amazing intimacy and sex with, with someone that we care about and we love. So I guess for me, Tantra is, is a way of being and a way of living where we're more consciously aware of, you know, our emotions, um, our ins and our outs and ups and downs and what allows us to show up in life being, you know, the best human we can be. Perfect little summary. It's far better than mine. I'm always like, I'm sitting there thinking. Let's hear yours. Uh, so mine, I was trying to explain, I usually go into explaining, look, so, a big part of this is that we all live in a world where we suppress all of our emotions and we get to a certain point where we can explain what's going on in the world intellectually, but we have very little understanding of how that works in within your body, Yeah, what we're suppressing, the emotions that we're going through, whether we're actually connecting with them or not. Um, I know that's the case for me personally. And I found that for me, Tantra was really digging into what is going on for my body. What are those sensations that are going through me and connecting with them mm. and when you're able to do that, obviously it leads you down all sorts of interesting pathways. <laughs> and, and as the Tantra treat went, all the weird, weird and wonderful exercises that we're then doing, mm. they really kind of bring that to the forefront and allow you to really dig into what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I know for me, it was a pretty powerful experience, man. I mean, how was it for you? <laughs> yeah, good. Um, you know, like I've been in the space of personal development for about 18 years or so now. Um, so there was, there was certainly some aspects of it that, um, you know, allow me to process or see things in a different light. Um, you know, and there's some aspects of it that for me personally don't really resonate with with my truths or my beliefs or where I've I've come to in my life or necessarily resonate with with uh, I, I, yeah, I guess that's it, my my beliefs and so forth. That being said, you know, people that are doing it for the first time or very early on in their in their journey, and by no means am I finished or complete or perfect at all. I'm not saying that. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying that I have done a lot of work and I've resolved a lot of emotions and a lot of trauma within myself that the biggest thing for me showing up the workshop was like going fucking wow, like pat on the back for you, for, for, for all that you have actually done over the past 18 years and all the closets you have, you know, cr crawled into within myself to be able to access that to where I can go to an event like this and not have many triggers come up. You know, like I remember earlier on, I'd go to these events and it's like every exercise, every word the teacher would say would trigger some sort of emotion or some sort of response in my body. And so it was beautiful to go to this event with my partner and every exercise come close together as a result of that. Whereas I've had a lot of experience in the past where I've gone to these things with past partners being like, yeah, we're going to invest on making our relationship better. And you walk away in more pain and more conflict than when you started <laughs> because every exercise brings up so much shit that you just don't know how to process. Yeah, I get that. Uh, for me, it was really interesting. I got a little bit of that as well. Um, obviously, I've been heavily invested in self-development for a long, long time. And there were so many things that came up for me. It was like a bit of confirmation. Like, oh, yeah, you are kind of doing things right. Yeah. Oh, you are kind of on the right yeah. path there, which is quite nice, especially from someone as amazing as Chantel. I mean, she's absolutely unbelievable instructor. Yeah, um, she, she, she knows the stuff. And I, I guess that's one thing I will say is having worked with a lot of facilitators and a lot of coaches and mentors and things, one thing that was very evident is that she knows her stuff in and out. And I guess... For me, the beautiful thing is, is years ago, I would have gone to events like that and hung off every word as gospel and, yeah. ta and, and believed I needed to take it all on board. And I guess for me, a big part of my evolution is to realize that I can actually say no to things or is it is okay that's, that, that the way people are or what they present or what they do doesn't resonate with me and I, I can choose that. That was something that wasn't available to me years ago. Like I would just show up and kind of like, I guess, go with the flow because I had this deep desire and need to belong. 
yeah. or to fit in. Whereas what I really experienced was so powerful for me at the at the Tantra retreat is that I could belong and fit in without having to believe all the same things that everyone else believes. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful point because it's so easy, especially when there's somebody who's in a position of authority, whether it be at some sort of workshop or just in the in normal life. Mm. Uh, but being able to apply critical thinking in all sorts of different circumstances and work out what is authentic for me, what is actually my truth, mm. that's hugely important. And I found myself in that space a lot. I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is for me. Yeah, There were certain points where we're kind of digging into different shadows and trying to connect with certain things. I'm just like, I'm actually genuinely really fucking happy. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is real for me. This I don't want to feel <laughs> anger right now. Like I'm happy, I'm happy feeling joy. I don't want to fucking cry. I yeah. don't feel angry. I'm good. I'm genuinely yeah. good, you know? For me, I don't want to fucking dance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, the other occasion. You're a little, I know you're a little bit absent of the exact <laughs> dancing noise. You're just like, fuck this. Can't be bothered today. I'm not having it. <laughs> oh. uh, it's I did actually like the dancing though, to be fair. The ecstatic dance is, is so... So weird to me because I think it's so probably similar for many people. Most of our experience of dancing is going out, getting drunk, jumping on the dance floor and going and having it. When you are just asked to dance when sober, it's a bit like, oh, this is a bit of an uncomfortable experience. With the lights on. Yeah, with the lights on. Like, <laughs> oh, I can actually see exactly what I look like right now. I'm not as good as I usually think I am when I'm a few whiskeys in. <laughs> really disappointing, by the way. Especially when you see Medessa absolutely smashing it. Yeah. He's got some serious moves. Shout yeah. out Medessa, you're smooth, man. <laughs> yeah, but it's a really powerful experience for me, man. And you talk a lot about being in the self-development kind of world for a while. Can you give me a little bit of context and a bit of background of what kind of work you've been doing during this time? Yeah, I, I guess for me, I, I'll, I won't go too much in my origin story, but I guess for me where it all started was, you know, like I, I left high school, got a job, did my apprenticeship, and I kept on finding myself in these situations where I was taken advantage of. Um, you know, in my apprenticeship, my boss was paying me next to nothing. He'd have me run the shop floor, you know, and so eventually I finished my apprenticeship two years in. It was a four-year apprenticeship, got signed off, moved on, and at 18 years old, found myself in my own business. And it was really interesting when I went into that, I was, I was scared shitless that I was like, you know, what was I doing? But, but there was an aspect of ego that's like, oh yeah, like this is the next step. And it wasn't until like a month in, I'm like, man, like I should have paid more attention to the people that I worked under and to my bosses and to people around me to kind of have more of an idea. And I was like, I've lost that opportunity to learn. But what I didn't realize was that was the start of my learning, being in my own business. Yeah. And, you know, I, I grew this thing from naught to $2.2 million in a few years with no prior business experience. Um, my old boss told me that I, was, I couldn't communicate and that I was shit dealing with people. And so there's an aspect of me like, well, fuck you, like I'll prove you wrong. And, um, you know, after that period of time, I, I grew this beast, but it was just that it was a beast. Like I grew myself a, a multi-million dollar job. What, like, what was the business? Uh, kitchen and bathroom renovations. Okay. So that was my background. And, uh, you know, I remember sitting there one day, like when I first in the business, I was like, I, I don't want to be like my dad. Like I want to be in a position where when I eventually have a family and have kids, I've got cash and I can be there for my kids because I miss my dad taking me to school and picking me up and sports games and things like that. Yet the funny thing was, it was like four and a half years and I, I met this woman, had a couple of kids um, accidentally, you know, both on, on birth control. And I looked up, I look, woke up one morning, it's like, holy shit, like I am my father on steroids. Like I'm actually worse than my father. I was working ridiculous hours. I was never there for my kids. When I was, I wasn't present. I was angry. I was thinking about business all the time. And uh, I was like, how the hell could I have attracted this? Well, I didn't think attracted back then, right? But I was like, how the hell could I have, could I be here right now when my goal was to not be my dad? And long story short, um, I ended up choosing to bankrupt that business because my partner left me with the kids and it was either stay in the business and lose her and the kids or leave the business and follow her across the other side of the country. And so um, you can hear more about that, like on my website, my podcast and stuff, The Comeback Game, where I dive a lot deeper into my origin story. But essentially that was the start of me going like, how could, how could I mess things up so bad? Like how could I be in this position where I have grown a great business, but I'm, com I'm, com I'm complete opposite of what I've gone out to achieve. And so that started me down the route, like initially it was spirituality, understanding, like I did my Reiki masters 18 years ago, uh, doing different aspects of color healing and sound healing and all different modalities of spirituality. Then it went into NLP, uh, learning you know, psychotherapies, quantum physics and that sort of thing. And then more recently, the last couple of years, it's been learning the embodiment aspect, realizing that you know we can cleanse and, and cure things from a spirit perspective, right? Uh, we, we can kind of purify things from an emotional perspective, from a mindset perspective and a behavioral uh, psychology perspective. But then the body still carries trauma. The body still carries memory that that is separate or different to those other two aspects. And that's kind of, I guess, 
where I've been finding that. But for me, like, I'm not sure, I'm sure some of your listeners can relate. Like I just grew up and I just felt different. Like growing up, I, I felt things like really, really intensely, like emotions, instinct experiences. And I always quite like felt like, like, who am I? Like, what am I doing here? This doesn't like this thing called earth doesn't seem like, like I must take the wrong stop on the elevator. <laughs> you know, this is not where I'm supposed to be because I just felt like I always was different. and didn't, didn't fit in. Mm-hmm. Now there's an aspect of that, which I think is being an entrepreneur, which I'm sure many listeners can relate to, but there was an aspect of me like connected with back then, not knowing, but like, I guess a deeper purpose in life and a deeper intuition, deeper knowing that I was here for something far greater than to, to find a woman, have it, have some kids and, and buy a house with a white picket fence. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can relate more. I've always kind of had this weird feeling that I was meant to do something powerful. I could never really put my finger on it, mm. but I just knew I was meant to do something. And I always found that as kind of like a driving force in everything that I did. Whenever I'd get stagnant or I'd get a little bit too comfortable, there'd always be that thing in me going, you should be doing something more than whatever it is that you're doing right now. Mm. Um, I'd love to, pull you back onto NLP a little bit because yeah. a lot of people don't really know what that is. And I'd love you to explain a little bit about to the, to the listeners what NLP entails and what it's all about. Yeah. Um, so NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. And it's essentially, you know, there's a number of ways you can explain it. But imagine right now that uh, you put on a set of sunglasses and they've got red lenses. Now, if you wear those sunglasses long enough, your brain is going to actually start to believe or to think that the world exists in a red hues right? That's the way that we're living life. We're living life and you and I have a different perception of life based on how we're filtering in the information, Mm -hmm. sound, smell, taste, touch, like these are the external stimulances that we're taking on board, which boil down to, you know, seven chunks plus or minus two. So what happens is we just delete, we distort, we generalize the information that comes around us. And therefore that's what creates our internal reality. We could both watch a car accident out the front window right now and upon replaying what happened, you would have experienced something completely different to me. Not because something different happened, but through the filter or through the glasses in which you're seeing life, you create your reality. So NLP is a very powerful uh, set of tools, I guess you could say, that allow you to, to dig back in the closet and to reframe or to rechange some of those past meanings. So, you know, from the age, from birth to age seven, they say it's, it's actually been proven that since the first trimester in our mother's, you know, as a fetal child, uh, we're taking on board experiences and we're making meanings of our interaction to life. But yet when we're younger, we haven't yet developed a brain. So there's a lot of us that are act, acting from a place of looking to, to two things like, are we safe? Like, are we safe in this? Or, you know, how do we reproduce? It's a, it's a primitive p- part of the function of the critter brain. Are we safe? And how do we reproduce? So we have these experiences where our mother yells at us or uh, we get shut down for crying and we create meaning around what that means. Unfortunately, the thing is, is those aspects that create meaning, they're created from a place of a belief to keep us safe. Yet as a 20 year old, as a 30 year old, as a 40 year old, we know that it's pretty, pretty safe if we wanna get angry. We know that having money is pretty safe. Yet unfortunately, the experiences that we learn to survive become the experiences that our continued survival depends upon. So if we've survived experience of poverty, if we've survived experience of sexual abuse, if we've survived experiences of, you know, relationship breakup, so forth, unfortunately, those, they've been programmed into our unconscious mind, into our critical neurology as being safe and survival experiences. So what that means is a 20, 30, 40 year old trying to make your way in the world, you wonder why you keep extracting experiences where people rip you off, where you can't make money, where you're in abusive relationships. You've only got to look back at childhood to realize that you've you've had those experiences that have been deemed as safe experiences because you've survived them. And what happens is we unconsciously keep attracting and looking for and manifesting those experiences to survive. What we haven't actually had is, is experiences of where we've been wealthy or where we've had amazing relationships. Sure, some of us had growing up, right? But our, our critical neurology hasn't had those experiences. Therefore, they haven't been flagged as safe. Which is why if you're struggling to generate wealth right now, you've got to look back at your child. Like you need to be able to work with a coach, work with someone who's got experience to condition you to survive those experiences right now in 2020, 2021. Because until that point in time, you'll keep going around the cycle trying to clear the past patterning and wonder why you keep hitting your head against a brick wall. Yeah, so you're essentially using an old set of tools for a, for a new set of events. Yeah. Normally. Okay, so what does the process look like with NLP? So how do you start rewiring those belief systems and the, the meanings that you've attached to prior events? Yeah, great question. I, I guess there's a number, of, like there's a bunch of tools in the NLP toolbox. 
But I think first and foremost is awareness. And at the end of the day, if your, your listeners are here right now listening to this, there's an aspect of them that are wanting to create something different, different to what they've had before. So there is a level of awareness or openness. I think first and foremost, and it seems really simple, but start to challenge your belief, like like consciously challenge, like notice when you say something, it's like, oh, like all all women play hard to get. You know, ask yourself, like, do they really, right? Is, is all the time or sometimes just start to notice those thoughts that you just haven't even questioned for a long time, like, oh, it's, it's hard to make money. According to who, right? The moment you start to, to challenge those assumptions or challenge those questions, you start to take, you start to lift them outside of the box you've created, right? Like whenever we see a problem, it's a problem because we've put, essentially put it in a box and deem that there's no solution around that. But in terms of process, like, man, there's tons on the internet, but honestly, like I'm a huge advocate of working with a coach. You know, like even myself now with, you know, 18 years experience in the field, I've, I've coached people one-on-one -on -one for more than 15,000 hours. Um, I, I still have coaches because, you know, as aware as I am and as connected as I am to my body and to my being, there's still stuff that slips past our biases that are so deeply ingrained, you can't pick up for yourself. And having a coach or having someone else that is trained in NLP and knows what they're doing, and I'm not saying trained as in they've done a weekend course because there's plenty of those like NLP practitioners that have done a weekend course and call them experts. Like they're fucking with your brain. Like find someone who has runs on the board and actually knows what they're doing, but they can call you out on the shit that you're just not even aware of because it's, it's just, it's, you're just used to it. Like you've been wearing those rose colored glasses your whole life. They're like, hang on, the world's actually green and it's blue and it's brown. Like take them off for a second. So in terms of processes, there's heaps, deep state repatterning, um, rapport building, language patterns, switch patterns. But I think most importantly, do like just find someone who's great, pay them and start to notice profound differences through working with them. I love you pulling up that point um, because it comes from a real humble place. You know, no matter what stage you're at in your journey, you can always learn from somebody else because we all have these set meanings, these belief systems we have and different people have different versions of the exact same reality. And if we can get different perspectives in our lives, it's always going to have a positive impact, right? Yeah. Um, Pro providing just, just on that one, like different perspectives, a mentor once told me though too, like, like if you want, like don't listen to anyone on anything that they haven't actually achieved for themselves. Like don't take, you know, financial advice from a broke person. So like, sure. it, again, like it's really important. Like don't just go, oh, like those dudes told me to go and hire an NLP coach and, and Google NLP and hire the first one you find. Like actually do due diligence to make sure that they've been practicing for a while, that, they've, that they don't just create results for their clients, but they have results in their own life as well. That's a, that's a big thing. Like I've met many people yeah. that are going and, and creating breakthroughs for their clients, but their own life is a shit show. You've got to realize that their, their biases are coming through in the sessions as well. Yeah. So you want them to have their shit together and be able to help other people in that same process too. Yeah, the last thing you want is somebody else projecting their own bullshit onto your life, right? I think this is a big, very big thing in Bali as well. I mean, there's a super abundance of coaches here and it's always a weird space to be when someone's selling something, they're offering a package that they've not even attained themselves. It's always really concerning. It's, and it's, in our industry, it's, it's exactly the same. Like Platinum, obviously we offer Forex training, we offer drop shipping training. There's so many shitty courses out there in this field by people that have never actually made any money doing yeah. it. They've just made a course yeah. and then sold that to people and they're pretending. And for me, it, I mean, it's a pet hate of mine. Sure. Yeah. One, it's a, like an issue for us and a massive objection to handle in business. But two, from a, an integrity standpoint, it just pisses me off, to be totally honest. And I can tell I'm getting that same that same impression yeah, from well, you with coaches. Like I remember when I when I was first starting out there, there is that aspect going, Well, like how do these how do these people get runs on the board? And it's like, well, they get runs on the board by being authentic and being like, Hey, like I've just done a weekend NLP course. Um, I'd love to offer you some some discounted sessions or I'd love to offer you some free sessions to practice my, like going in there with, with I guess, that pre-frame and authenticity around where they're at rather than, like you said, like I've got this amazing course that produces phenomenal results, like join on right now for two grand. Mm -hmm. When they haven't actually got the results, it, it hasn't even been proven or tested. Like they've got to start somewhere as I did and as you did, mm -hmm. right? But be mm -hmm. honest and authentic with where you're actually starting from, I think is a big, big thing as well. Yeah, totally, totally. So 
that was a beautiful summer of NLP. Absolutely love that. I think that's going to help a lot of people. I'd love to now move on to the more embodiment side of things because especially in my own journey, I've gone very much through the intellectual side of personal development. You start to get common themes throughout all the different books and podcasts and all the information that you consume. One thing that's very rarely touched on without going down the spirituality route is the embodiment side of it. Mm. So what really took you from the mental aspects of self-development to a more, a more embodiment spiritual uh, kind of direction yeah great great question I, I guess like i started my journey in the spiritual aspects so meditation like i was meditating when people thought that people that meditated were dope smoking hippies and like they they weren't far wrong either to be honest like back then but that being said it's a lot more commercialized now and, yeah. and i guess as the world becomes busier and busier people are, are feeling the call to go within to find stillness and to find quietness mm -hmm. for me the body work actually started um it was a couple of things i did a workshop with um some amazing amazing facilitators like if you ever get a chance to work with them i highly recommend it uh that's preston smiles and alexi panos uh they're from the states and they run a workshop called the bridge and extreme leadership and i did them very late in my journey probably two years ago and i still reckon they're that like the number one or two course or workshop i've ever done in my life and i've done a lot of work um, but they did some like somatic practices in there some practices around using breath and body to move energy through the body and this was probably my first um i guess introduction to breath work yeah. you know i've done a lot of meditation and pranayama and stuff like that but that's very different to like breath work uh, you know, to actually clear and cleanse and move emotion around the body. Mm -hmm. And so I did some embodiment practices with those guys and I just couldn't believe how free my body actually felt. Like I experienced like aspects of being pain-free, which I can't remember the last time I wasn't carrying some sort of pain or some sort of burden within my body. Mm -hmm. And that was what started getting me into this aspect of breath work and realizing that I'd done a lot of work spiritually, like I guess cleaning up my spirit, my soul. I'd done a lot of work emotionally and mentally cleaning up my mindset but my body was still carrying these different patterns from i guess being conditioned from my spirit soul my mind in the past and so going through the process of like breath work is super super powerful yeah. you know and that's something regardless of like whether you believe in spirituality or not like you're just breathing like and let's be honest you need to breathe to survive yeah but holy shit like i've had some like deep uh, hallucinogenic experiences just with like an hour breath work class like massive release of emotions i didn't know were there huge insights behind them my body moving in ways that i've, I've never experienced moving before through going through those processes and aspects of i guess aesthetic dance and yoga yeah. you know one thing that i link it to is uh, i think you mentioned before you talk about tantra is that you know i wasn't brought up and i know most of your listeners weren't brought up um be, being given permission to express our emotions you know especially being a man like we were brought up that you know you weren't supposed to cry like you know you, you, men don't cry like you gotta be tough if you cry you complain or whinge get sent to your room so we got brought up in these suppressive environments that allowed us to express our emotion mm -hmm. yet emotions very healthy and it's very healthy to be expressed you look at animals when animals go through a traumatic experience they shake and they shake straight afterwards because shaking allows the body to recalibrate and to stop those memories or that trauma that emotion to be stuck in the body we as human beings don't do that. We've been brought up in a culture and environment where we're told to suppress our emotions. And this is where I find like ecstatic dance or yoga can be really, really powerful to allow your body just to move and flow as you intuitively feel. And you would have found through Tantra, it's like one minute you're dancing this way, which is like the way that you dance in the club. And next minute you're like dancing completely differently, unjudgmental, but it's like you are so in tune with the feeling of your body. You can almost start to access past memories and past emotions coming up. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely something I went through the whole process. Once you get past the initial part of, I look like a dickhead right now. <laughs> Once you get past that, which is something that you actually face in everyday life all of the time. So that's like a massive suppressing factor anyway. What do mm. I look like in my environment? huge thing mm. uh, which is obviously like a set of beliefs that we've gained over time um, once you get past that you really start to feel the emotions move through you and it's really really interesting especially like in some of the to give some context some of the dances that we did we were asked to dance in a way we we're angry and then we have to dance in a way where we're in love and just go through all these different sensations and when you're dancing them you're kind of acting them out and you start to slowly feel them move through your body and for mm. me especially as somebody who suppressed my emotions most of my life it was alien to me. It was mm. completely alien feeling this kind of energy inside my body. It was really bizarre. Um, I'd love to go move back to breath work a little bit because I'm not sure a lot of listeners know about this. Mm. Um, 
how it works is, I mean, breath work, it's breathing, right? Mm. But can you give us some of the, the principles of breath work, what that looks like, the different effects that has on the body? Yeah. Um, just before I do, just to, to tie off what you said as well, mm. like you said, you, you were asked to kind of like, I guess, are we acting out different aspects? Yeah. You know, most of us travel through life reacting to life, right? So something happens, someone cuts us off and we react. And we haven't been taught how to regulate our emotion. We haven't been taught how to, to regu regulate our state of being. And this is what meditation, this is what breath work, this is what, you know, yoga, ecstatic dance, NLP allow us to do is it allows us to have the tools in our toolbox to consciously create and choose our emotional state. Now, if you enjoy being pissed off or wound up or stressed out, like just keep doing what you're doing. You know, but often we haven't been actually taught how to then be able to shift that state to move back into a state of joy or pleasure or happiness and so forth. And this is where those three tools can really help us to start to more consciously create a life. And, you know, likes attract likes. Like if you want to create wealth, if you want to create abundance, like that comes first from being wealth and being abundance within not going out trying to make a ton of money. Like I'm sure you've got a bunch of listeners, myself included, that, you know, I always made a shitload of money. I never had any money though. Like I would always make money, but I never had any money because I didn't have solid beliefs around wealth, yep. right? I could make it, but I didn't know how to grow it, didn't know how to keep it. That has changed since I've worked on my internal connection to wealth, to abundance, to, to self-love as well. Where breath, I get breath work, you know, if you look at it this way, breath is kind of like the original medicine. You know, from the moment we're born and we take that first breath, we, we breathe our whole entire life. Yet when we experience these different traumatic situations or these different experiences where we get shocked or we get uh, startled or something like that, we can kind of like, <gasps> and hold our breath. And what that does is it starts to create irregular breath patterns and it starts to prevent us from taking a full deep inhale and exhale and breathing through, which breath is designed to help to purify the body and the mind right, from emotional, mental, physical level. So breath work helps us to essentially start to re reprogram that connection we have with our breath to allow things to restore to work properly. Now, there's different types of breath work from like holotropic type breath work to, you know, the Wim Hof type stuff where he's is more around helping you to kind of withstand, you know, heightened situations. But, you know, either way, uh, there's one that the guys from Oto Awakening taught me, which was like 30 breaths in and out. CCB breathing, so conscious connected breath. So in and out through the mouth, <sighs> deeper and deeper, 30, uh, sorry, 10 seconds, then hold all the way out for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, hold all the way out for 10, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, hold for as long as you can. And that simple process, it's like five minutes, will give you profound insights and clarity around, you know, how, how to make better decisions, uh, maybe what to let go of in your life. But again, like we just, so busy running from point A to point B, we don't stop and allow ourselves time to gain presence and to, I guess, get really clear on what we want. Like mm -hmm. I can imagine many of your listeners are hustling, trying to create these online businesses. But the question I'd ask is for what purpose? You know, like what's actually driving you to create an online business? Like, what do you want? Oh, I want financial freedom. What does that actually look like? Like great buzzword, but what does it look like? Is it 10 grand a month, 20 grand a month, 100 grand a month? Is it net? Is it passive? You know, if you've got investments, like the, the clearer that you can get with these things, the more you can consciously create your life. And again, breath work allows us the time to stop, to check in with our body, to clear any emotions or any irregularities that are causing us to make shitty decisions based on past trauma, to get clear on what we want and to move forwards with, with discipline and action. Yeah, I love creating that space. I often talk about that myself. It's the difference between being proactive and reactive, right? And even aside from the health benefits and the wonderful clarity it brings you, just taking that time to stop and consider what it is you're actually doing is hugely beneficial. I've got a really erratic mind. I'm like the ADHD kid, always have been. For me, it is the most invaluable tool just being able to either sit and meditate, just mm. actually get some clarity in that way. Uh, and now breath work, which is something I've recently incorporated into my lifestyle. Um, how would you use breath work and meditation on like a day-to-day -day basis when you're starting to go through different things and different things arise for you? Yeah. Um, I used to suffer from a lot of anxiety, actually. It was really weird. Uh, I don't know whether it happened before the bankruptcy or after the bankruptcy, but I had these experiences where like I just wake up with an overwhelming amount of anxiety or I'll get it through the day and I eventually pinned it back to its connection to like my financial situation. And one thing that I found is I was able to use breath work. Like when I felt that anxiety, I was able to use breath work. And within like one to two minutes, like I was back in a state of like power and control. Now, for anyone out there that's ever had anxiety, like it can be crippling and it can really, uh, I guess, you know, 
prevent you from making decisions and taking action and moving forwards. Like there's different severities, but it, it absolutely affects your ability to move forwards. Yeah. Breath work or using breath in that moment in time, like I tried meditating, but like I'd sit there and, and all that happened, I'd become more focused on it. Whereas breath work allowed me to actually go further within and clear whatever that emotion was and be like, oh, cool. Like now I'm, I'm, I'm back empowered and I can take action again. For me, um, typically me and my partner wake up, the first thing we do is we do like a breath work practice for, for three to five minutes. Yep. Um, from that breath work practice, we will then move into doing meditation. Um, so we'll meditate generally for minimum 20 minutes. Sometimes I'll meditate for up to an hour and a half. Um, I prefer certain guided meditations. Um, some people like to sit in silence. For me, I like to be kind of guided, but that's how I start my day. And, you know, I've really noticed when I don't do it, the impact that has on my life. Like I honestly believe my, my morning ritual and my, my practice helps condition me um, to be consistent to be disciplined, yep. but it also sets a day up with uh, me giving to me first before others. You know, I think a lot of people wake up and they check Facebook, Instagram and emails and they reply to messages. And it's like, that's, that's you're allowing your data to dictate to you how it's going to play out rather than you waking up dictating to you today how it's going to play out. Yeah, I love that. It's something I, I always notice myself. There's been times, as I'm sure you and every listener here has, some days you just do, you just reach for that fucking phone and it always ruins your day. And it is simply because your attention is being pulled to other people's lives rather than your own. Would you rather spend your day thinking about what you're trying to achieve or pondering the the achievements of other people? Mm. Which one's going to serve you better, right? What other kind of useful things do you have in your toolbox as part of your morning routine? Um, yeah, so breathwork, meditation. Uh, I'll always try to read for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Usually I read a chapter of a book. Yep. I find, um, again, I just think that it's a principle of, of being wealthy is being educated. Um, so so, you know, I'm always reading books on business, on spirituality, on personal development. Um, yeah, a chapter a day usually. Mm -hmm. um, if the surf's on, it's definitely a two-hour surf. But regardless, the gym six times six times a week as well as part of my practice, like eating healthy, um, getting a good night's sleep. Like I know this seems like basic stuff, but for me, you know, back in my teens, I was eating shit food. I was smoking tons of weed. I was... You know, my sleeping was very erratic. Like there was definitely no consistent practice. And I honestly believe this has got a lot to do with my successes that I can have that. Like usually my, my practice is two to three hours a day for me. I, I'm lucky enough I can afford to spend that. You know, when I was hustling and working a lot harder, it was a lot less than that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, gym, surfing, meditation, breath work, reading. Um, that's pretty much it. Playing guitar usually for 10 minutes as well, just... Good chat. We'll have to have a little jam. I've just started playing the guitar. Oh, really? Yeah, just before I slip that in there. Yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. So a really important part I find is, again, it's creating space to do mm. the things that you need because maintenance takes so much time, right? For me to be able to do all the things that I need to do, whether it be my practices, whether it be working out, getting the education that I need, that actually is like a full-time job, yeah. essentially. So getting some level of automation in your business, creating that time to be able to dedicate yourself to your wellness, which are the things that are really going to make you better, that are going to make you happy and fulfilled as well. What are some key things that you apply to automating the different businesses that you have? Because I know this is an area that you work in quite heavily. I'd love to hear some like key principles or things that you would advise to people to get more space in their lives by removing some of the bullshit from their businesses. Yeah. Um, if you are a business owner, definitely jump on Amazon and check out The Path to Freedom. Uh, my book, The Nine Steps to Create a Profitable Business That Works Without You. You got a book about it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know Amazon, that. Amazon bestseller in six hours from I've launch. Done, oh, I've done some really shit research here. I've really fucked this one up. <laughs> no, apologies, <laughs> mate. I really should have scoped this one out. <laughs> oh, yeah, God. so check, if you are a business owner, check that out because, you know, like this is, this is what I do and what I've done. Like I now have multiple businesses that operate day-to-day -day without me being involved. Um, many of my companies, I spend an hour in a month. Uh, my main business, I spend maybe four or five hours in um, a week, but the rest of them is an hour a month. And a big part of that, a few things, like I think number one is um, letting go of control. Like as entrepreneurs, you know, that thing that actually causes us to go into business for ourselves in the first place is the thing that causes us to be stuck in business. Uh, so I think being willing to let go of control, being willing for things not to be perfect. One of the hardest things we have as entrepreneurs is when we start to hire staff, we're afraid uh, that things will get fucked up and they will. And that's part of the journey. But I actually welcome that because every time there's a mistake, every time something happens, the first question I ask is, was the system followed? You know, like we've systemized everything in our companies 
And the beautiful thing is that you as the entrepreneur don't have to be the one to systemize it. That's what I teach in my book. You know, you write one system, which I actually give you in that book. I give you the, the only system you need to write, which is, is the system for writing systems. Once that's written, it's like you train someone how to do something, you hand them the system and they go and document it, create the system for that for you to check over and sign off on. Yeah. So they literally build build the safe operating the, 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 the safe operating procedures for your company to operate without you being involved. You know, us as entrepreneurs believe we have to be the ones that, that do it, yet a lot of what we're doing is unconscious competence. We've been doing it so long, we don't even know all the steps anymore because it just happens naturally. Yeah, yeah. So when we teach someone to do it and we ask them to document it, they can ask the questions they need to know to fill in the gaps. So I think number one, like get over yourself, be okay for things to stuff up and welcome it. You know, like failure, problems, challenges, it's just, it's just feedback. It's just feedback. Cool. Like, how did this happen? How do we put something in place that doesn't happen again? Like, it's really that simple. But, but don't see it as being something you have to do all at once. Like, it's a journey. I haven't gotten here, like, overnight. It's taken me years to get here. And you can get there a lot quicker through reading my book or through hiring a mentor or someone as well because, like, they've gone, they've been there and done that. Uh, the next part is leverage. You know, I think that uh, stupid people spend time to save money. And smart people spend money to save time. And one thing I see a lot is entrepreneurs, when they first go into business, they start making coin. They're like, oh, I can buy this new car, this new TV, this new motorbike, get this new apartment. And they go and piss all their money up the wall uh, because they're wanting short-term gratification. Whereas if you had to park that aside and use that initial money that you make to reinvest in your company because you have a profitable model, you can have all the toys you want and more within a very short period of time, but have a business that supports that for life. So this is where I see, like, if you're starting a business, take a minimum wage and use that money to to smartly, you know, reinvest back in assets. You know, see yourself as a financial planner, like an asset manager, right? Managing time, managing people, managing finances and reinvest that money into areas that will free you up to allow you to focus in high growth areas. So let's just say that, you know, you sell coaching and you're a thousand bucks an hour, right? Why the hell would you make your own lunch? Like, unless you really enjoy that. Just hire a chef, right? Why would you clean your house unless you enjoy that? Just hire a cleaner. Two reasons. One, like don't do anything you don't enjoy. Two, it frees you up to go and invest that time into something that's going to make you higher money. Um, but three is, well, you're actually providing you're providing income for somebody else. So like energetically, the world keeps going around. So I think that again, like, you know, delay immediate gratification, reinvest back in growth, and then set up systems and set up automation within the company so that things can start to happen without you. Yeah. I absolutely love that. I'm a massive advocate for not doing anything that I don't fucking want to do. <laughs> I'm pretty lucky right now, like a platinum, the guys that I work with are absolutely amazing. We've all got completely different roles. Everyone likes doing what they're doing. I basically want to sit here and talk shit with really interesting people like yourself. <laughs> I want this to be my job, but I tell you what I don't want to do. I don't want to set up fucking cameras and lighting. Yeah. Not really interested in that. <laughs> Luckily, I've got my boy Scott who's going to sort that out for me. He's amazing. Yeah. And that allows me to live in my genius, right? It allows me to do the things that I really want to do, yeah. which I'm going to apply myself for. And I think that's an amazing, amazing concept that people need to understand real early. Because yeah. people get really tight with the money. that I, They start like watching every single penny, don't they? Rather yeah. than watching the time they're investing into things that they don't like. So let's talk a little bit more about automation. Um, I know that you also run a VA company. So tell me about the value of that because this is something that really interests me because I've got a background in e-commerce and drop shipping. So I've worked heavily with VAs and seen the advantage of that. I'd love to hear about it from your point of view and the kind yeah. of value that they bring. Yeah, we, we first started looking to VAs about four or five years ago. Like I had a mate that owned a company. He's like, oh, like you should hire them to cheap labor. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll admit that was how it started for us. Oh, we can hire cheap labor. Um, but as most people that go out to hire their VAs, their first VAs are Fiverr or Upwork or something like that will find, um, we, we made a lot of shit hires. Now, in hindsight, they weren't shit hires. They were shit on boards. Like we hired awesome people. We were just terrible at bringing them on board, terrible at giving them the instructions, terrible at telling them what to do, essentially. Yep. So over the years, we've kind of perfected the process of not only finding out how to hire like absolutely amazing VAs, because there is some out there that do the wrong thing, that rip you off, that don't show up, that kind of take the piss a little bit because they are working virtually. But really, like it's less than 5%. Like it's a very small rate. And if you have the right things in place, you can tell, if not in the interview process, very early on before you even get them on board into your business. Um, but I guess the advantages are because of cost of living, you can hire them for, you know, 50 to 60% less than what you pay a local staff member. I've actually found that their worth ethic gen as a generalization is far beyond Western society, um, far beyond Western society. Often I've found they're actually smarter as well. 
Uh, if you find the right VAs, there's two type of VAs. The VAs that are able to follow instructions to the T. So if you have a system or process or can, can train them and then build one, they'll deploy that thing all day, every day, like clockwork, right? Which the typical Westerner doesn't like to just do the same thing all day, every day. They're happy to do it because they're pleasing somebody, they're making somebody happy. And that's big for them. The second type is more so like the, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial organization. They don't want the risk of having to go and find their own money, but they're actually good at making decisions. They're good at strategizing, they're good at moving forward. Now, if they're with the right employer, they can be a phenomenal asset to your business. You know, like in uh, my core, one of my core companies, the game changers we have, I think eight or maybe nine VAs, they do everything from like sales, right? Like both appointment setting to sales closing, uh, marketing, uh, debt collection, client care, um, management, management of, of, you know, 30 odd other team members. Like really? they're, they're amazing employees, but again, you know, cost advantage of hiring them. You've got to, you've got to treat them differently. Like typical Westerners are driven by like KPIs and get driven by performance metrics and bonuses and stuff. They're not so much, they love money, but they're more driven by like, how, how invested are you in their life and in their family's life? Like if you're invested in them and their family's life, they will do whatever it takes to please you and to look after you and do the right thing. And again, they love money, mm -hmm. but it's very, very different. That's where a lot of people mess up, which is why like at Alchemy Outsourcing, part of what makes us different is not only we, I guess, find and recruit the right person for you, but we work with them and you to onboard them over three months so that you know how to treat them, how to set up the measurables and the KPIs and accountability and so forth. But the VA as well, we help them to know how to communicate with you. And once you've got the first one in, in up and running, like it's very easy to get a second, a third and a fourth. But again, you can hire two or three for the price of what you pay someone locally. Yeah, I love that concept as well because essentially it's obviously cost effective for any kind of Western business. It's great, but it's also amazing for them because they're coming from a place where they don't really have many opportunities to earn a hell of a lot of money, right? So if they can earn five, ten dollars an hour, that's a great wage. They get a really good standard of living where they're coming from. So it's like the ultimate win-win, yeah. which is obviously with Corona and everything going online, I just see this as like the natural way things are going to go i think Absolutely. there is no safety or security having a st like a job or being employed you might as well set up your own business because it's so easy to do nowadays there's so many different options and you can actually get give employment to people in less privileged economies who can then earn more money than they otherwise would so you get to take charge of your own destiny and you give somebody else more power in a who isn't as privileged as you may well be to take charge of theirs as yeah. well and it's a really powerful, there's a really, really powerful synergy there. So I really like what you're doing, man. I think it's well, Yeah, it's, it's funny because no doubt, like there'd be listeners listening right now and I've had it plenty of times. Oh yeah, but like you're taking jobs away from Australians. And here's what I'd say, you know, all locals, here's what I'd say to that two things. First and foremost, if Australians had the worth ethic, right? And the, the, the you know, they would show up on time, they'd work the, the job, there'd probably be more jobs for them, first and foremost. But secondly, if I can go and hire VAs that help me to grow my company, make more money, I'm spending more money in the Australian economy. I'm hiring more Australians because there are still, you know, I've got just as many Australians that work for me as I do Filipinos, mm -hmm. but they've helped me to grow my companies faster and more profitably, which allow more money to fluctuate, to float back into the economy, in to contractors in marketing or contractors in, you know, recruitment in other areas and so forth. So like, Yes, that's one very narrow-minded way of looking at it. Yeah. But just zoom out for a second, look at the bigger picture of things. Yeah, it's just economics, right? You have to be able to zoom out and understand the, the impact it has in different areas. Yeah, and I think that's an amazing, amazing thing. I'm definitely going to be taking on some VAs for Platinum. I'm sure we've got some jobs that need to be done here. Yeah. Sorry, bad news, Scott. I think you're, you're getting swapped in. You're, you're out, you're out, <laughs> mate. Um, I think your time's up. <laughs> so we've got a bit of insight into the kind of business you're involved in. Um, you're obviously doing all sorts of different things. That's the entrepreneurial mindset. What are you walking towards at the moment? What are the goals for Barry like right now? What do you want to achieve? Where do you want to go? Yeah, it's a good good question. It's something I'm asking myself a lot of the moment as well. <laughs> well, you're gonna have um, to think about this one on the spot now. Yeah, the the one thing I'd say, um, and I say this to our clients all the time, is it's like once you've built that first business, like once you've got the first business to a position where you know it's profitable. Right, number one, and you're managing the assets well. Number two, it's leveraged that you're not needed to be in there all day, every day for the thing to run. It's like you've 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 done the hard road. It's like you've learned the skill set. You can replicate that. And the beauty is, is most likely the second and third time around, you, re you replicate that in an even better niche. Because I think a lot of people fall into the business. They love doing what they're doing, but it's maybe not the best niche or the best business opportunity. I've, I've met a lot of really smart business owners 
that are fucking broke because they're just in the wrong, they're, they're, they've got the wrong product to the wrong market fit. And I've met a lot of other people that are terrible at business, have no fucking idea what they're doing, doing a million bucks a month, and they don't even know how they got there because they just have the right product in the right marketplace. And so I, I guess regardless, you know, like I read a book from Brad Sugar's um, Billionaire in the Making, and he talked about, you know, get one business to a position where, you know, it's leverage, it's profitable, it doesn't rely upon you, and then use that to cash flow the business. And essentially that's what I did. Mm -hmm. You know, I got the game changers to a position where I exited uh, in, in December last year, Start up alchemy outsourcing an hour a month. I put in that business, and that thing is growing ridiculously fast. And then I've divested into accounts, in bookkeeping, into sales, into a whole bunch of other businesses as a result of having the skill sets and the mastery, I guess, in that in that one particular area. So at the moment, there's a few things like I've I've been heavily uh, into property lately and just growing a property portfolio. The main reason is just diversify the risk. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've got businesses that are working, but now it's kind of I guess growing my portfolio horizontally. Um, but really, like I want to start playing around a lot more in the in the event space, like in the retreat workshop, personal development space. You know, that's what I've always had in my heart of hearts. What I'm known for amongst our clients is around the more personal development, the mindset, you know, the mixing spirituality with psychology. Um, but I guess I've never put together a workshop or program to the general public. And so that's something that I'm really keen on. And to be honest, at the moment, it's just enjoying life. You know, like I've busted my balls the last 18 years and you know, worked ridiculous hours and sacrificed a lot to be where I am. And I'm not by any means advocating that that's what you should do. I actually believe the opposite. You know, I'm kind of against the Gary Vaynerchuks and stuff that reckon you need to work from, you know, 4 a.m. in the morning to 2 a.m. in the morning and get up and repeat it seven days a week to be successful. I don't believe that at all. You know, knowing what I know now, if I'd have had this knowledge back then or had someone like me to, to mentor me, I could have got to where I am as fast, but having a hell of a lot more fun and with all the sacrifices that I made. You know, so I believe you can have your cake and eat it too, and you should be actively carving day to day the vision you want for your life right now, even though you might not have the money just yet that you want. Like bring in what elements you can and, and, and enjoy the journey a lot more than, than hustling to get there. So for me at the moment, like I'm really happy working one day a week, you know, and the rest of the time I'm surfing, I'm hanging out with my kids, I'm hanging out with my partner, I'm hanging out with friends, I'm going to all sorts of weird and wonderful workshops. Um, I've been writing, I started writing my second book. So I'm halfway through doing that. Like it's a very different approach, I guess, just doing a lot more what I feel called to rather than like chasing the outcome, which I guess I've been doing that for my whole life. So at the moment, um, to some people that say I'm lacking ambition, to me, I'm, I'm enjoying the flow of life a lot more. Yeah, I, I completely agree with your ethos. I'm all about living in my joy. I, I've done a lot of grinding, done a lot of things I didn't want to do. I want to be having fun the vast mm. majority of the time. And I think there's definitely a point of diminishing returns. You can grind, 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 but there has to be a point where you pull back mm. and go, hang on a minute, am I even enjoying what I'm doing? And then mm. recalibrating, like you said at the beginning, what am I even doing this for? Mm. What's the actual goal here? Is it just because this is a, I set this idea that I had to achieve something I don't even want anymore. Mm. That's something I did. I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. And I decided that when I was 20. What the fuck did 20 year old Joe know about what he wanted when he was 30? Yeah. But I was attached to that idea for so long, chasing it to the point that I didn't even enjoy what I was doing anymore. It's wild, right? Mm. You, said, you actually said something beautifully at lunch the other day. You said, you know, like, like, this is actually it. Like we went out, not for a business lunch, not to talk shop, we went out just to catch up as mates. Mm. And then what came out of that was, was several amazing business opportunities for both of us. Mm. You know, and I guess that's the opportunity that you do have. Like, yes, you, you've got to do your work. You've got, you've got to put the time in, but taking time out to meditate, to do breath work, to get really clear on what you want and be more intentional around what you're doing will get you to where you want to go a lot faster, a lot more enjoyably than just busting your balls because you're trying to belong to the millionaire club. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'd love to hear what advice would you give to people that are just getting started out on journey? I mean, that advice is huge, absolutely mm. huge in my opinion. People that are just making that leap, they're just really starting with their online business. What would you say is like some of the key principles they should abide by in that pursuit? Yeah, it's been interesting. My partner's going through the process of a startup and so I'm kind of reliving a startup like through her, which, you know, it's been a long time since I've kind of been through that process. And a few things I think, you know, like take the pressure on you, off yourself. Like just realize that if you're clear of like, like, you know, first and foremost, get super clear of what you want and why you want it. And then be clear that every day you're working towards that. Like if I was to get up right now and go to walk to this camera, if I take one step, I'm not going to get there. Right? If I stop, I'll never get there. But if, if I just keep stepping forwards, eventually I'll reach the camera. And it's the same thing. Like if you're clear of what you want, where you want to go, just focus more so around getting up every day and taking a step. 
right? Don't compare yourself to where someone else is because unfortunately on social media, like we're comparing our behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel, right? And it can be very, it can be very um, debilitating when you're early stage in business where you've got pressure to make money and so forth. So get clear of what you want. Make sure that every single day and every single week, you just take a few steps towards that and know that eventually you'll get there. Now you might not get there in the unrealistic time frame that you perceive or in the time frame that some other influencers got in there online, but don't give up because their journey is not yours and yours is not theirs. So ensure that you're clear what you, what, what, what you want to achieve, you take steps towards it, that you actually fucking enjoy doing what you're doing. Like, what's the point? Like, what's the point of working your ass off to, to make money to then spend the money to buy things that you enjoy? Like, just find a way to enjoy now. You know, some of the happiest people I've met are people that actually haven't got cash but I love cash, cash is good too, mm. right? But do something you enjoy doing, surround yourself with mentors and, and advisors. Um, but again, ones that are fit for where you're at, right? Do your research and make sure that you hire people and just keep educating yourself. I, I guess, know that you'll get there, yeah. right? Know that you'll get there and don't fucking give up. Like I, it wasn't until probably February this year, I was like, huh, like I'm actually now <laughs> experiencing some level of success. You know, but it's like my overnight success came 18 years in the making. Now, I don't believe it has to take that long. I think you can actually do it a lot quicker than that. I was a very slow learner, but I never would have got there had I given up, you know, and there's so many times I could have given up, like so many times I could have given up, but I was just so determined to to just move forward at any cost. And holy shit, like I'm a far better man because of it. You know, having gone through those challenges, like you're going to hit hurdles, you're going to, you know, get punched in the face and knocked down, but just keep getting up. I think that's an amazing point to end on, man. I absolutely love that. And I couldn't agree with that statement more. It's all about taking action, right? You've just got to take action. Um, please let people know a little bit more. You've, put, you've touched on some of these things, but let people know what it is you're doing, where they can find more information about you uh, and yeah. how they can get in touch. Yeah, so the book I mentioned before is The Path to Freedom, yeah. uh, the nine steps to build a highly profitable business that works without you on Amazon. Uh, you can check it out there. There's also an audio uh, on all the audio download channels too. Uh, otherwise, the gamechangers.com.au is the coaching company. Uh, alchemyoutsourcing.com. We'll put the links below this, I imagine, somewhere yeah, as well. Sure. Uh, if for some reason you have a trades business, you're a plumber, electrician, carpenter, we have an amazing program uh, called Tradie Business School, T-R-A-D-I-E, businessschool.com as well. Check that out. We can absolutely help you to blow up your trades business yeah. in a good way. Yeah, tell me, touch on that a little bit. I know a little bit about this, but I actually know a few people that would be really interested in this. So just elaborate a little bit more about what that is. Uh, we just, you know, so, so the Game Changers, we have two coaching um, programs and typically we work with people that are at least at a quarter million dollar a year mark, up to 20 million. And what we started noticing over the years is we attract a lot of tradies um, and we're really, really good at helping them grow because they need a lot of help and we simplify things so much so that anyone can do it. And yeah. so we made the decision this year, it's like, why don't we build a program specifically for uh, tradies, whether they're a plumber, electrician, a builder, a landscaper, it doesn't matter, all trades uh, work for, and registered the Tradie Business School and have launched that internationally, uh, UK, Europe, US, and Australia. And essentially what we do is the first three months, we help them to get, get on top of their cash, uh, get on top of their time, and get some really solid uh, you know, principles and disciplines in place for the remaining nine months, we actually go through each of the steps in my book, The Path to Freedom, break it down, give the templates and help them implement that step by step. So after the, after 12 months, they're making more money and they have a lot more time than they've ever had before. That makes so much sense. I suppose by the very nature, if you're a tradie, you probably are less likely to be spending time on a computer. So there's got so many different areas that can be improved upon and automated using yeah. the technology that's available, right? Absolutely, Absolutely love that, man. Um, this has been a hugely, hugely valuable podcast for so many of these people. I think there's insane value here. Uh, you're a really, really interesting guy with an epic story. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, man. I'm sure we're going to meet up plenty in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. This for your time. is the Platinum Podcast. Platinum Podcast.